Welcome to the Friday edition of Wines World and today I'm going to continue the topic I started on Tuesday uh, which I called uh, fantasy and sci-fi and I suppose I could call this fantasy and sci-fi part two but instead I'm calling it enchantment because I want to delve a little deeper into some issues associated with fantasy that are a bit more general and deal um, more universally with um, topics related to magic and society and science and religion and whatnot. And my topic, although it's technically enchantment, is actually more about disenchantment and then probably next video <laughs> re-enchantment so we need to talk about what enchantment is and what disenchantment is why it's important in the sociology of culture and how it relates to fantasy sci-fi fairy tales and all the rest of it so Let's get enchanted. Now the, the word enchantment etymologically is really related to general concepts of magic, um, the supernatural and what have you. And what I'm really actually dealing with are German terms because I'm going to be talking mostly about the German sociologist Max Weber and his theories about culture and he was interested in among other things how ideas are the prime movers of historical change and he was in this mode as an opponent of Marxist theory so we can think of Marx on one side and Weber on the other side. Marx believed, uh, simplistically I have to admit, that changes in material circumstances in a culture caused changes in the way the culture was structured and the way it thought. Whereas Weber took the contrary point of view that is that changes in the ways people think changed the way the culture worked and changed their material circumstances and technically we call Marxists, Marx or Marxists materialists because they believe that material changes are fundamental changes in the physical world changes in things like the means and mode of production. So if you change from being a feudal society to a capitalist society, that happens because there are material circumstances that change. So for example, the Black Death of the 14th century onwards made huge changes in the population in Europe and made feudalism basically not viable because feudalism relies on a very large peasant population at the bottom of the pyramid and when you have a third or more of the population die feudalism is no longer viable and so you change to a different system and 
Marx argues that the change to capitalism occurred because of those physical changes. Whereas Weber argued that changes in the ways of thinking about the world led to changes in material production. He wrote a very, very famous and influential book called The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, in which he argues that changing ideas, changing from being Catholic to being Protestant, led to changes in the way that European cultures were structured. And this was in answer to um, a very old question, why were certain countries industrial whilst others were agricultural and why were the industrial cultures largely Protestant, uh, namely Germany and England, and why were the Catholic countries, namely Spain, Italy, France, largely agricultural? Well, I mean, that's actually a pretty oversimplified way of thinking about things, but that was the question. And so Weber's answer was when, when the ideas change, then the culture changes. And so he is called an idealist, meaning ideas are paramount, as opposed to a materialist, where material is paramount. Now, just to be fair, I don't actually subscribe to either. I believe there's a symbiosis between material circumstances and ideas, and that they feed each other, but not important right now. So one of the things that Weber argues is that the rise of rational science, starting in the Enlightenment and moving on into the industrial era of the 19th century. One of the effects of the rise of rational science was the diminution in belief in the supernatural, which we now see sometimes as the debate between religion and science. But what started to happen in the Industrial Revolution, according to Weber, is that people saw science as the answer to their problems as opposed to religion and to the supernatural. So that if you got sick, you would try to find a solution in scientific medicine as opposed to in prayer or in magic potions or shamans or some other supernatural solution. And he called this process disenchantment, although he didn't use the English, he used um, German, he called it Entzauberung. Sorry about my German, I don't speak German, but anyway, it's Zauber is the German for magic, and Ent is not, and Ung is like Ing, so Entzauberung could be literally translated as unmagicking. So disenchantment doesn't mean, <laughs> you know, like you're disenchanted with your husband or with your boss or something but that you are losing faith in the supernatural. And Weber was very concerned about the disenchantment of the Western world that he saw as being manifest in things like the loss of interest in fairy tales. So um, he, thought, I, I, again I think wrongly, that people believed the tales 
that they told the Grimm's at one point they believed that there was um, a some princess called Snow White with a wicked stepmother who had a magic mirror and the magic mirror could tell her who was the most beautiful in the world and so on and so forth that the magical world of fairy tales in German called Märchen which means more like household tales rather than fairy tales but these tales of fairy godmothers of of good and wicked fairies and so forth were all believed in at one time but were no longer believed in and he saw this as being problematic and the belief in rational science had its merits but it also had its downside well now in more recent times there was a um, psychologist called Bruno Bettelheim who wrote a book called The Uses of Enchantment very interesting also complex and controversial book a complex and controversial person but he argued that you can take a tale like Snow White and you can see that under the enchantment is a simple metaphor for everyday life that instead of thinking about the wicked stepmother and a magic mirror and a beautiful stepdaughter just think about the relationship between mothers and daughters now one of the possibilities is that mothers can become jealous of their daughters as their daughters grow up become beautiful become attractive to young men become um, sexy if you like whereas the mothers can lament the fact that they're getting older they're not as beautiful they're not as attractive now I'm particularly fascinated by the idea of magic mirrors because I think all mirrors are magic that is we're all capable of going to the mirror and saying am I beautiful and for a long time the mirror <laughs> or the image in the mirror anyway looks back at you and says oh, of course you are but then there comes that fateful day when you look in the mirror and you say when did I get old <laughs> when, when, when did I get all these lines and this gray hair I'm old meanwhile my child is young and beautiful or handsome what am I going to do and what Snow White says is that if you decide that what you're going to do is maintain your beauty by suppressing your child it won't work out well <laughs> in fact it'll kill you that you are much better off nurturing your child bringing them to maturity whilst you age gracefully and accept your aging and then everything will be all right if you try to resist the passage of time it's disastrous and you will lose and what Bettelheim is saying is that that message is hidden in the enchanted story but when mothers read or recite that tale to their daughters they are internalizing the message 
So that's the, for him, the use of enchantment is that it, it disguises the message so that you can surreptitiously absorb it and accept it. Hmm. Well, you know, I'm not entirely sure of all of Bettelheim's analyses, but that one, that one struck a chord with me, not only because of the, the magic mirror, because I, I just love the idea of, of mirrors being that magic. I mean, they really are that magic, but also because of the idea of growing older and accepting the aging process and helping your child to mature as the morally and also personally correct way to live in the world. So if we then return to my, in my thoughts from last time about fantasy and science fiction, I'm going to reiterate my initial worry about that, and that is that I'm concerned because the underlying message of all of the Star Trek uh, franchise, all of the Star Wars franchise, all of the Harry Potter franchise, and so forth, is that good will triumph inevitably over evil. Well, the two things I really don't like about that. I don't like simply dichotomizing good versus evil. I well remember many years ago having several students ask me when I had question time in my um, lecture sometimes and one of the older students asked me, why do bad things happen to good people, which to some extent is a uh, religious question. And my answer was, I don't believe there are good people. I, I believe there are people. People, they do things that are sometimes constructive, sometimes destructive, sometimes functional, sometimes dysfunctional. I don't believe there are good people. And I'm not not so uncertain about bad things, I mean, <laughs> but you never know. I mean, something that happens to you could be bad, could be good. Um, like maybe you break your leg, well, that's a bad thing. But if it stops you being drafted into the army <laughs> and getting killed, then it's a pretty good thing. So we have to take context into account. But more than that, I just don't like the idea of personifying good and evil as these um, conflicting forces. So I don't, like, I don't like that being manifested in television series or movies or what have you. I mean, it does give hope in some ways to say, well, the people that I like in this fantasy prosper and the people I don't like get punished. But I'm not sure that that's a very solid moral message. Now I do, however, believe that there are important uses of enchantment. That is, I think that the disenchantment of the West has caused problems. It's caused problems because there is an over-reliance on science and rationality as the answer to all of our problems. And they can solve a lot of problems, certainly in medicine, for example. Uh, let's hope we have a vaccine for COVID-19 so that we can get back on with our lives. Um, there are vaccines for measles and so forth and all good. Um, not getting t all the way there with cancer, but getting a long way. Um, 
heart repair so forth all, all good and that, that's fine but when it comes to considerations of love and community values and beauty and so forth then rationality sometimes fails us and that's what I worry about when it comes to having uh, fantasy um, and good and evil being battling each other being too simple-minded that we need to be thinking in different terms entirely and we need to be thinking at least in my view in enchanted terms we need certain areas of our lives to be enchanted and like love for example is one of those areas and I don't believe there's any substitute for that so how are we going to bring enchantment back we can't just uh, return to where we were two or three hundred years ago so what are we going to do well that's the subject for next time and meanwhile please tell your friends like subscribe and i've got a recipe i'm pretty sure to start on tuesday but i'll also talk about re-enchantment see you then